Good morning and welcome into worship this morning. Before we begin, I'd like to start with a few announcements that are up on the screens, but for those on, on Facebook or listening on the radio, um, we will be having a confirmation meeting next Sunday, immediately following worship. So if you have a, um, a student in your house who is in seventh or eighth grade, uh, please plan on being in worship uh, next week and staying after for a meeting. Uh, with us. Confirmation will then begin um, October, Wednesday, October the 7th. We'll begin at 7 p.m. As far as Sunday school goes, Sunday school will be ramping up here on October 11th following worship. So if you have any desire to be a, a Sunday school teacher, uh, please, please let me know and we will get that started. During that time, uh, we will also be running an adult Bible study um, so if you have kids, drop them off, come to adult Bible study. Or if you don't have kids and want to be a part of uh, study, stay after church with us starting on October 11th. Let's see. Oh, Hope is hiring. We're hiring somebody to deal with, um, not deal with, to manage to be in ministry with those under 18 to help strategize and plan um, in the ministry of those under 18 and do a little bit of administrative work as well. So if you're interested or know somebody who would be great for that position, uh, please reach out to me or, or Sue Terzo about that. And then last, last but not least, I was given this announcement. If you are free uh, this evening from 5 to 6.30, uh, the Winnebago Ranch Hands are putting on a, a benefit concert at the Carlson Country Chapel. Um, this is to benefit, um, the proceeds go to help veterans who are needing homes. This person who is um, who is putting this together has, has bought the old Methodist church in Winnebago and the school there, and is transitioning them into homes um, for men and women who are in need. So if you're free this evening from 5 to 6.30, it's a free will offering. All proceeds go to, to help veterans and those who are, who are homeless in this area. Uh, so please go out to Carlson Country Chapel. I think that's all. Did I miss anything? Good deal. Thank you. Would you please join me in the call to worship? We'll lead it responsibly. Sing praise to God who rescues us when we fall. Sing praise to God who walks with us on all our journeys. Even though we fall, God lifts us and places us on the paths of peace. Even though we stray, God finds us and brings us back to lives of hope. Thanks be to God, whose love is continually with us. Praise, Praise be to God, whose mercy is over us all. Amen. Uh, please uh, enjoy the hymn, Old for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, for the one who died. <laughs> Oh, 
join me in the unison prayer. In this moment, you have called us to wait in the world to a place and a time where we can be with you and with one another. Bless us this time, we pray. Call our anxious spirits that we may be set apart to hear your word of truth. In which we receive the greatest. Great about the ingredients of faith. O oh, us to the realities of your all and grace and love, both in this place and in the wider world. May we, by our words and actions, be bearers of your kingdom. In the name and spirit of Christ. Amen. Now we will have the It is well with my soul.
Today's scripture is from Judges, chapter 3, verses 15 and 26. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, son of Mira, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The Israelites sent tribute to him, like to King Eglon of Moab. Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he fastened it on his right thigh under his cloak. Then he presented the tribute to King Eglon of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. When Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent the people who carried the tribute on their way. But he himself turned back at the sculptured stones in the gateway and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. So the king said, Silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. Ehud came to him while he was sitting alone in the cool roof chamber and said, I have a message from God for you. So he rose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into Ehud's belt. The hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the sword out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Then Ehud went out into the wet vestibule, and closed the doors of the roof chamber on him, and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came. When they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, he must be relieving himself in the cool chamber. So they waited until they were embarrassed. When he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened it. There was their Lord lying dead on the floor. He had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the scripture, sculptured stone and escaped to Syria. Amen. I just had to include today's story. Uh, it's not often that us left-handed folks get to be the center of attention. And, and since I'm the one who, who picks all the scriptures, um, I decided that we were going to use this one. Um, so lefties out there, if there's any of you with me, uh, this one's for us. And if you, didn't, if you didn't catch it, that is one of the only descriptors of our little giant Ehud, that we get. All it says is, here's Ehud, here's his dad, he's a Benjamite, and let's not forget he's left-handed. Which is very on brand for left-handed folks. I can't tell you how many times I'm just writing something down, jotting a note, and the person has to stop me in the middle of my writing to tell me about some distant relative or some co-worker's daughter that they know who's left-handed. Oh, my co-worker's daughter's left-handed. Like, it's some special thing. It's like we're some, this mythical group of people that you only see once in a while, like unicorns or something, it's left-handed people. So I get it. I can just imagine Ahud's reading through his Bible and he gets to the part about him, and I bet he's so excited, he goes, I know about that, I'm the second judge, this is gonna be about me. And he's so excited, he's, He's anxiously waiting like a performer who runs to the newsstand when they used to have those things and, and buys a newspaper to get the review. That's Ehud. He's getting ready. And he's so excited to hear what they have to say about him because he's a judge. He's an important guy. And they go, here's Ehud, son of Gera, the Benjamite. And oh yeah, can you believe it? A mythical lefty. That's Ehud, our little giant for today. And I'm mostly kidding um, about his left-handedness because in that time, for him to be a lefty would not have been seen as some fun fact. Uh, when I was growing up, being a lefty was always my icebreaker when we had to say a fun fact about ourselves. It would not have been that for Ehud. He would not have told people readily, I'm a lefty. It would have been something people would see as neat or even Orky. In fact, the description of Ehud as a lefty said all that you needed to know about that person. 
It'd be like if you told me, if you said, I'm a Packers fan. That says all I need to know about you. <laughs> Full stop. Don't tell me anything more about yourself. <laughs> I know that's a troubled person. <laughs> so Ehud, to say, I'm a lefty, people would full stop. We know everything we need to know about Ehud. He's a lefty. He was lesser. He was a, seen as having a deformity. He was useless in people's eyes. Not a full person. And so as we enter into this story, we can't forget that. We can't forget that to say, here is Ehud the lefty, that here is Ehud, someone seen as less than human. Someone as flawed as they come, Ehud the lefty. And so in walks our deformed hero. Our hero who people would see and says that person has very little worth. But Ehud, as you heard, and Ehud with God on his side has much different plans. You see, at this time there was this guy named Eglon. Eglon was a Moabite, and, and all you really need to know about Moabites is they were the bitter rivals of the Israelites. Moabite came in and just made the Israelites' lives torture. He was a ruthless man. He was a harsh leader. But here's the thing about Eglon. Eglon didn't get there on his own accord. You see, Eglon got into power because God put him there. God put Eglon, this harsh ruler, this ruler that Ehud has to kill, God put him there. You see, we're in this period of time in between the leadership of Moses and Aaron, and we're in that middle period before the Israelites complain enough to God and finally get their kings. We're in this middle portion, this middle portion in which we have the judges. These are the leaders that God raises up to bring the people back into right relationship. Here's how it goes, and this is basically like our lives, I think. The Israelite people do a, a really good job. They're following God. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do, and then they fall off. They backslide. They forget that God got them there. And then they start sinning against God, and God punishes them. God sends in someone like King Eglon to take over for them. And then the people go, oh wait, we need God. And so they repent, and they repent, and God sends them these judges to make everything better, to bring it back full circle. And this continues on and on. It's basically the story of the Old Testament. Repentance, good times for a little bit, sinning, needing God to bring them out. Right now we're in that punishment period with King Eglon, the Moabite. We're in this punishment phase, and Eglon, Ehud, comes to bring the repentance period. Eglon is our next judge. The people are ready to be in this moment of prosperity before they will fall off the horse again. And so Ehud creates a plan. It's a pretty good plan. You see, for most, if you're going to carry a sword, you're going to carry it on your left hip. Because, of course, that makes it easier for a right-handed person to pull out their sword. And if you're left-handed, you don't need a sword. You're not going to be in the army. You're not going to have that type of power. So it goes on your left side. That's just where it goes. The proper hand. And Ahud knows this. And Ahud knows he can't put it on that side. So he decides, I'll put it on my right side. Because no guard would suspect that a worthless lefty would be able to threaten a king. The guards would only check the left side for a weapon. And when they found none, Ehud knew they would just let him pass. They wouldn't even try to check the right side. They would let him carry on with his business. So Ehud does this. He attacks a dagger, attaches a dagger to his right side and tells Eglon, he says, I have a secret for you. And I love that. Ehud knows that no one would see him as a threat. Ehud knows that. 
He knows that he could be alone with the king because nobody would suspect anything from him. No one would assume a lefty could do anything. So they don't even bat an eye when Ehud says, hey, I need to be alone with you, king. Which, if I learned anything from Game of Thrones and watching Lord of the Rings and, and all of those medieval things, it's that you never allow people to be alone with any sort of royalty. That's like guard class 101. It doesn't matter who. The king is never alone. When the king is alone, bad things happen. But what could Ehud a lefty do? Well, you heard the story. Ehud draws in close to whisper in his ear. Pulls out his dagger from his left side and drives it from his right side and drives it deep into Eglon. And Eglon, we're told, is so big that this, this entire dagger goes inside of him all the way past the hill. So nobody can see it. There's no blood involved. It disappears. And here's where I can't believe this story makes it into the Bible. It says that Eglon, when being killed, defecates and releases his bowels upon being killed. And after that, the Bible continues on. If that's not weird enough to be put in our Bible, then it says Ehud escapes through the upper room, which isn't a pretty upper room devotional. In a king's palace, if we follow this train of thought, the upper room would be where the bathroom would be for a king. Our guards say they believe that Eglon is using the restroom, and so they don't go in to find him, so Ehud escapes through the upper room, and they didn't have indoor plumbing, so what it's really saying is Ehud locks the door behind him and escapes through the toilet. And the Israelites are free again. The end. That's our little giant for today. A sneaky, conniving, deformed lefty who kills a king on the toilet. And so if you're asking me what message we get from this, the only answer, the only message I can find has to be we have a God who works in mysterious and unexpected ways. If you were to ask me what I would be preaching about um, in my first church out of seminary, never once would I say that I would be telling a story about a guy who goes to the bathroom in his pants and I was quoting the Bible. I would never have expected to say that. We have a God who works in unexpected ways. But that's continually what we learn in the Bible. We learn that God is going to work in ways that are counter to the way we see the world. God is going to call a couple who are way past their prime child-rearing ages, and he's going to bless them with enough kids to start a nation. God is going to call one man who has trouble even speaking and says, you're going to hold court with Pharaoh. You're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pharaoh, and you're going to free my people, even though you think you can hardly speak. God works in unexpected ways. God is going to call, and he does call, that fumbling man's sister and calls her and says, you're going to be a prophet. In the church, we're still struggling with that unexpected reality. God calls a woman to be a prophet. He picks a teenage mother with no experience and says, that's the type of person I want to raise my son. Jesus picks a few fishermen, and he says, those are the types of people I want to be my first disciples, to be my best friends. Jesus preaches an entire sermon that says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, the lowly will be brought up. He tells a story about the only person willing to help someone on the side of the road is a Samaritan who is anything but good in the eyes of the people. 
He tells of a father who welcomes home his son, no questions asked. Jesus saves not through military power, but through his death on the cross. God takes his biggest opponent and says, that's the type of person I want to write most of the New Testament. My biggest opponent. You see, Ehud's story is one story in a book of stories that flip our expectations, that challenge how we view the world, that challenge us to view others in a different way, that challenge us to view our neighbors in a certain way, that challenge us to view ourselves in a certain way. You see, Ehud was seen by the world as deformed, as weak, as less than a person, and yet God never once saw that in him. God saw a judge. God raised him up this way. God saw someone that could redeem his people, and that, that's all that mattered. If there's one thing that I've learned about God, is that God is constantly inconsistent with who he calls constantly inconsistent. He is constantly bringing up people that the world see as weak, deformed, damaged, less than human and saying, that's the person I want to save my people. That's the type of person I need for this ministry. That's the type of person I need to spread my love. My question to you today is, are we looking at ourselves the, word, the way the world looked at Ahab? Are we focusing on what the world would say is our weakness and letting that define us? Are we defining ourselves by our weaknesses, by our shortcomings? If so, I give the most pastor answer ever. Read your Bible. Just read the Bible, flip it open anywhere, and you're going to see a, an unexpected hero, a little giant. Read the many stories of broken people who are made whole. Read the story of Saul on the road to Damascus. Read the story of Jonah, whose biggest weakness was used to save a whole city. And if you forgot about Jonah, his biggest weakness was that he didn't want to save the whole city. God used an unexpected person. Read about Pua and Shifra again. I bring them up every week. Read their story. Outsiders used to save the world. And read those stories and know that God sees more than our shortcomings. But let us also be a church that doesn't define others by those weaknesses. See, Edmond's biggest downfall was not seeing potential in a lefty. It was his inability to see the worth in someone else that was his downfall. If he would have believed that Ehud mattered, that Ehud had something to provide, the story never would have happened. The people never would have been redeemed. Let us be a church that doesn't define people by their weaknesses and their short shortcomings. Or I think it might be our downfall. Church, we have a God that flips our expectations. Let us be a church that lives into this unexpected nature of God. You see, I don't know who God's going to raise up next. I don't know who God is going to call. Maybe... And maybe God isn't going to turn all of our weaknesses into strengths. It's probably not. I don't know. But what I do know is that God will never define us by those weaknesses. That will not be what defines us in God's eyes. It's not going to be what defines my neighbor in God's eyes. It won't be the thing that gives you worth in his kingdom. And I can confidently promise that. Because the Bible is just one long story of little giants and flawed heroes.
Amen. Now is the time where we we come together and we share our, our joys and concerns before the Lord. Do we have any joys to lift up today? The sun is shining. The sun is shining. Yes. Yes. What a blessing. Do we have any concerns this morning? Yes. Linda lifts up uh, Larry Parsons and, and the entire family as, as they are mourning the loss of, of his brother, Terry Parsons, this past week. Please keep the Parsons family in your prayers as they are mourning. Brian Miller would like us to lift up prayers for, for her brother, Kevin, who has just found out that he is positive for COVID after officiating at a at a wedding this past week. Please keep Kevin in your prayers. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for calling us here to be together in your house. We thank you for the gift that it is to gather, whether it is here in this, in this building or on the radio or sitting on our couches. Lord, we thank you for, for calling us all to be a part of this community of worship together, even as we may be separated. Lord, we thank you for the joy of the sunshine as we came into your house this morning. Lord, we thank you for the gift of this this world, for your creation. Help us to find you in the midst of this world. Help us to notice our blessings. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of, of the help that we are experiencing today, for the answered prayers, for families and friends. Lord, help us to be more mindful of your goodness. Lord, we come to you with, with many joys in our hearts, and we are so thankful, and yet we come to you with many concerns as we look upon this world. Lord, we pray for your healing hand to be over Kevin as he is managing his positive COVID test. Calm his, his mind and spirit as he worries whether he got someone else sick. Be with him. Lord, we pray for all of those on the West Coast who are living in the midst of these fires, who are losing homes and lives. Lord, bring rains, bring hope. Lord, we pray for all of those who are, who are feeling lonely, Who are isolated, those who are battling mental health issues, those who are living in states of poverty, those who are experiencing homelessness. Lord, give us hearts to be with them. Give us hearts to reach out to them. We pray for all of those who are battling illnesses. We pray for the Parsons family as they are mourning the loss of Terry this week. Be with them today and in the days to come. Be with all of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Lord, we pray for those who are making decisions. Give us grace, knowing that we wouldn't want to make those decisions. We pray for our students and our teachers and our support staffs at school as they have just completed their first week back. Keep them safe and healthy. Lord, we pray for all of our, our doctors and nurses and, 
and those who work in our hospitals and doctor's offices, keep them safe, protect them. Lord, we have many other prayers on our hearts, many other concerns. And so we come to you now in this moment of silent prayer, knowing that even if we can't find the words to say, you hear our hearts. Lord, hear now our silent prayer. Let's pray together that prayer. Jesus Christ taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you for working. 
worshiping with us today. It was so good to be here with you and praise God. Um, one announcement I did forget, on October 4th, we will be recognizing and praying over those who are confirmed um, this last spring over a Zoom call. So, so please come out and support those who have been confirmed. It won't be a full confirmation service, but we are just wanting to recognize them in person and pray over them. Uh, so that will be on October 4th for those that were confirmed this last spring. And as always, as we leave, we'll be ushered out back to front so you can just relax a little bit. I guess a reminder about this afternoon or this evening at 5 to 6.30 um, at Carlson Country Chapel to go support, uh, listen to some music, a free will offering uh, to support homeless vets in our area. So now go with this, go with this benediction. Go into the world knowing that Christ does not see you for your weaknesses knowing that Christ sees your worth at all times. Go with the promise that God will be with you always. Go with the peace and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.